Okay, so I'd like to introduce the uh, next talk, which is uh, introducing the Bali Teacher Education in EAP Special Interest Group. And the speakers are Carol McDiarmid, that has a long history in teacher education, uh, is at the University of Glasgow, and uh, Program lead and lecturer on the MED and MSC TESOL programs. Um, she's been a CELTA and DELTA trainer. She's been very deeply involved with the um, Bali accreditation scheme and the fellowship and developing the fellowship scheme as well, accreditation scheme. And uh, Lindsay Cox, who is the head of teacher development and scholarship at English Language Education at the University of Edinburgh, also very involved in um, CPD programs and uh, Stella Bunnag, who is an EAP lecturer at Nottingham Trent University, um, also involved in uh, teacher education, curriculum design, digital learning and publishing, EAP publishing. OK, so thank you so much for coming here, being here and telling us all about uh, your special interest group. In this uh, conference, there uh, are there is uh, a lot of concern about teacher development, and there is um, reported lack of. Uh, uh, well, it's noted in research that there is a lack of um, teacher training in EAP and and EMI as well. So I think this is a group that is helping to do something about it. So I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your talk. Thank you very much, Natalie. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning or good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, I'm Lindsay Knox, and along with Carol and Stella, we are committee members of the Bali Special Interest Group in Teacher Education for EAP. And as Natalie outlined, what we'd like to talk to you today about is a little bit about this group and what we do and how we try to promote and advance teacher development um, in EAP and we'll also have a little bit of time to talk about some approaches that you might take to developing yourself or developing colleagues as well. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next 40 minutes or so. So a little bit about us, about our special interest group. Um, we've been in action for I think about two years now and we came into being um, as a result of a conversation initially between Carol and me, we talked about, as Natalie mentioned, this issue of teacher development in EAP and thought it would be a good idea to have uh, a special interest group. And Balik were doing that at the time. They were inviting people to um, begin special interest groups. And we thought teacher education in EAP was a good place uh, to, to look at different issues. And... I think when we started, it was initially Carol and I thinking from our perspective as teacher educators and looking for a network of teacher educators. But what we realised when we began to gauge interest from, uh, well, from everyone associated with Ballyp and other networks was that not only were teacher educators interested in having a place where they could come and talk about these issues, but also there were a large number, a high number of individual practitioners who don't benefit from having an institutional affiliation and who don't find it as easy to get those um, different ways of developing themselves and access to uh, training or development. And so the SIG was born. And as you can see on the slide, these are our aims and what we try to do. So it's very much about creating a community of those two constituent groups um, to think about the different approaches that you might take to teacher development in EAP. And when we talk about EAP, we are talking about both English for general academic purposes, but also English for specific academic purposes. So the special interest group is very much about bringing those groups together and thinking about approaches to developing our practice. It's also about surfacing a lot of the needs because many of those needs are hidden. Sometimes you can be um, thinking that it's only particular things within your own institution, but we wanted to get a, a better sense globally of what the needs of practitioners were. And we also want to become a place where we can create resources and also share resources uh, for practitioners in EAP. So the committee is composed of these lovely people here all women, but that's not deliberate. Um, and all of us work across 
different universities in the UK mostly and um, with, with, as with all Ballet events, all Ballet organisations and SIGs, it's all voluntary. So we do this in addition to our day jobs, um, but we very much see it as benefiting us in our day jobs as well and hopefully helping other, other practitioners globally as well. So I'm going to hand over to Stella and Stella is going to talk to you a little bit about the kind of events that we've been organising so far. Hello, everybody. Um, so, yes, we, we run lots of um, online and face to face events and we've done um, conferences overseas and we've done them in the UK. And the types of events we, we've done range from um, guest speakers um, who are experts in their field come along and do workshops for us. Um, we've also got reading groups so we'll we'll choose a particular article that's a topic of interest in the field at the time um, and then we get together and we we talk about that in groups. Um, we've done conferences um, and, and also some of our members and non-members have, have put in proposals to actually come and talk on particular topics as well. Um, so that's the, the kind of events that we do. Um, next. OK, um, and so we've we've done so far 11 events um, this year. Um, and as you can see, um, we've had up to about 123 um, attendees at our events um, and the, the feedback we've got is really good and um, we've got very high satisfaction rates and next and we are currently planning our 2023-2024 events um, and as I mentioned as well we, we really encourage people to um, come and come and speak at our events um, so if you've got anything uh, that you're working on or that you think would be a topic of interest, um, please fill out our proposal form and or, or get in touch with us. And we'll, we'll share details a little bit later. Next. Um, and we've got a Twitter account, so you can follow us on Twitter. We've got 361 followers at present, and that's rising. And next. And we've got a, a YouTube channel. Um, we've got all recordings of our, our events over the years there. Um, so you can also sub subscribe to our YouTube channel. Next. And you can become a member. Um, so we've got 171 members at the moment um, and we've got um, 97 members within our, it's kind of like our Gismail or community forum as well, which you can also sign up for. And we're international. Um, we, we've, we've got membership across uh, uh, 11 different countries. Um, and when, when you become a member or if you attend one of our events, you can get a certificate. So you can get a membership certificate, an attendance certificate, um, and you can use these as evidence of your, your own professional development. Next. OK, and so the question there is, why join us? And if Stella hasn't convinced you that there's lots of interesting things going on, this slide is just trying to expand on that a little bit and to think about how this will help you um, and Carol's very helpfully pointing out in the chat it's free that's maybe one of the more important things our events are our membership is free and um, all our events so far have been free as well but I think there's a, a lot to be gained from joining a group like this especially if you feel a little bit lonely sometimes in your profession and wondering how you can develop yourself so there's by joining our, our group and getting those membership certificates, that's a way to evidence your commitment to the profession. It's a way to show that you're engaged in your own professional development. It's a great opportunity for peer networking. And so all of us have met people and it's a, a starting point for some great collaborations as well. One of the things that we do is that we work quite closely with the TEEP officer. So the Teaching English for Academic Purposes framework and some people want to pursue accreditation in the fellowships, the Balik fellowships. And so some of our events are closely linked to those TEEP uh, TEEP competencies. Uh, so that's a way to, to help you advance with collecting your evidence for those fellowships. Uh, there can be opportunities for institutional cooperation, cooperation so working together with, with colleagues not in your own institution. 
there's possibilities to begin research projects um something may spark an idea so you may think oh that person i might want to talk to them and maybe we could work on something together um but also just generally it's a good way to engage with the the knowledge base in your in the profession and to engage with the the discourses of, of the profession as well so obviously we're um we think it's a good idea that you join us and be delighted to to meet more of you um, coming with us. Um, obviously, we're a bit biased as well. We think it's great, but we've recently tried to collect feedback on what our members think about us as well. And um, so you can see a little word cloud. There's some really nice words there, things about having you know a sense of community. It's interesting, it's thought provoking. And one of the interesting things that came out of that is that also people can feel reassured. Sometimes teaching can feel a bit lonely, especially when you're working quite individually and you maybe don't have those other peers to talk to. So it can be reassuring to come together and realize that other people are doing the same kind of things as you as you and, and have the same rationales for doing things. So um, that's what our members think. But Stella is also going to give you a little bit of an insight into her own um, experience of being a committee member and what she's gained from the SIG as well. Yeah, so I, I think before I joined the SIG, I was um, a little bit shy to present. Um, I would have found that quite intimidating. Um, but being in that kind of small, war, smaller, warm group um, and giving some workshops or, or doing a little bit of talking kind of gave me the confidence to do more. Um, so much so that I've now joined, I, I'm, I now work within two other SIGs because um, I enjoyed it so much. And it's it's given me that motivation to um, present at conferences and also you know since then I've I've written research papers I've learned how to do it um I've set up funded projects um so it's 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 quite a big change for me within the last sort of four or five years um I've learned from the colleagues I've learned from people I've met and that's impacted my teaching and how I develop courses um and I understand now the benefits of kind of working within um, a framework of, of professional development like the TEEP scheme. And I've um, gone on and, you know, you've got um, higher qualifications. And I think, you know, um, I've made some great friends. I've made some great contacts. And I think one of the benefits, um, I was thinking about this last night, that, you know, we get so busy in our jobs that we never give ourselves that time to just talk with people and reflect on things and I think that's what you know being part of a SIG just gives you that time to do so uh, you know I, I found it really beneficial and I'd really encourage you to join us um, so yeah thank you. Okay so we've talked a little bit about what we've done already as I mentioned we're all the SIGs are relatively new and we're really just starting out and beginning to find our feet and find out what it is that we would like to do and what our membership would like us to do so looking to the future some of the things that we want to think about is we'd love to be much more present at international events such as this one um, talking to you today and I think it's important that EAP doesn't become a a domain simply of English speaking countries. EAP is practiced in multiple diverse contexts all around the world. BALIP wants to be a global association. And as one of the SIGs, we also want a global insight into how EAP is practiced. So we're very keen in the future to, to really promote teacher development and think about those approaches on, on a global scale and not just within our own tiny institute. Um, we're also keen to really, we talked about what are the CPD needs of EAP practitioners. And one of the things that we started is a mapping survey uh, to survey members and other EAP practitioners as well to find out really what, what is being done in terms of teacher development. Um, Natalie mentioned at the beginning, you know, there's a lot in the literature about there not being enough or not quite knowing what it should be. So we're keen to kind of get a, a sense of the state of teacher development in EAP globally. Um, we also this year would like to focus more on the teacher educator strand. A lot of our events so far have been focused on more on the development of individual practitioners. So we're really keen to um, 
do things which help the work of teacher educators as well, people who are responsible for organising CPD for others. Um, and we'd also like to work more closely with our colleagues in the other Bali special interest groups. And we think there's interesting synergies there as well. However, we also want to continue some of the good things that we've done, and we're very keen to um, try new events as well, and to think about things like moderated discussions, perhaps exploring possibilities of a blog, that kind of thing. And we also want to continue asking our membership and anyone else uh, to, to participate in our events and to actually lead and propose events that we could run. So you'll see there, and we'll put these links all at the end, we'll put these links in the chat again, but we have a proposal form. So if you're sitting there thinking, I have a brilliant idea for the teacher education thing, um, and I'd really like to, to share that idea with them, please do get in touch. We're very keen to hear from everybody who has something to say about teacher education and development. And even if you don't have something that you want to present, you might want to hear about something. So please do contact us on the email address and say, hey, I'd really like to have something where we talk about this for example. And so there's links there how you can join us and follow us. But as I said, these, these links will go into the chat at the end. Um, it's important as well that we don't just hog all the limelight. So as well as the teacher education and EAP SIG, there are also at least 11 other special interest groups under the umbrella of BALIP. And there's some new ones coming in as well. You can see some of them there. If you go to the BALIP page, um, you'll find uh, all of them. But just to give you an example, there are some discipline specific special interest groups. So if you're particularly interested in, for example, law, so English for academic le legal academic purposes or STEM, there are special interest groups for that. There's ones about academic literacies, doctoral education, if you're involved in supervising students. Um, there are many, many more and they all run lots and lots of events. So you could pretty much attend a, a SIG event probably every week, I think, or at least you know every two weeks. So please do have a look at the Bali page and see what other SIGs are running and what might interest you. Um, so hopefully we've given you a little bit of food for thought thinking about um, our particular special interest group. And we'd love you to join us and to become a member or follow us or run events for us as well. And you'll see there's a QR code there which takes you to our web page and you can find out about how to, to join and uh, make suggestions and proposals. I'm going to hand over to Carol now, who is going to talk a little bit about more about the approaches that you might take to um, teacher education in EAP. Carol. Hi, morning, afternoon. Um wherever you are. So obviously when we're thinking about teacher education in EAP, we need we do need to think about what we want to explore. So for example, the second point there, the, the context specific needs of teachers and students um, that can be informed by the Bali Teep competency framework um, and thinking about what it is that we explore in the EAP teacher knowledge base. But today we're going to introduce you some to some approaches for how people might develop their skills and knowledge in EAP. Doug Bell was talking in the plenary yesterday about the, the need for, for teaching and education. Um, this is looking at what individuals or institutions can do out with um, an actual uh, training course or programme. So we're thinking very much about having research informed and research led practice that reflects uh, what academics do in the university. We research knowledge is currency. And what we've got here are a range of approaches that we have all tried and used in our institutions or within our groups that can help support EAP teacher development. So I'm actually going to start with the two in the middle. And for, for all of these, we do have a worksheet which uh, we have a, a link to and we'll share you later if you want to use this within your institutions and organisations or groups or networks of friends to talk about the approaches and how you might set them up. Um, and one of the things we started quite a long time ago in our university and lots of people do is an EAP reading group. It provides obviously background knowledge on areas of interest. We, 
in terms of setting one up, you obviously you need people that want to talk to you for a little bit about something connected to your area. Your area. You'd want to set up a repository or somewhere where you can store links for what you've read. Um, you might be in an institution and have a VLE like Moodle or Blackboard to do that or even shared documents. And then typically what would happen is you take turns to select an article of interest and maybe some discussion points and then meet. We typically do it over sandwiches, lunch, coffee and discuss it. You could do it face to face or you can do online online. And if you go on to the Bali six, you'll see that lots of them have um, their own reading groups and reflective practices, um, reflexive um, chats and talks there. Depending on where you work, you have, may have more or less access to academic journal articles, but you'll see in our worksheet, you want to try ideally to aim for open access journals and the International Journal of EAP Research and Practice that comes out of Liverpool University Press is a useful one with open access EAP related journals. The reading is really important because obviously it helps inform our practice and it can also inform our scholarship work. And so another thing that you might do is develop and work from a scholarship framework in. Not everywhere, but in some institutions we talk about scholarship as the, the research of your your um, practices, but research and practice of teaching and learning in EAP and a scholarship framework will take you through a whole cycle of setting the goals of your projects. What is it you want to do? What do you want to achieve? preparing for your work for you. So not only doing innovations or exploring something in the classroom, but getting the literature brace um, there to establish your work, which can also help if you're writing work up. So what's been done before, what you can find in the literature in the area, then thinking about the methods. What is the best way to explore and gather um, data? Do you need to get ethical approval? If you're going to publish and disseminate or take to conferences, you typically need to show that you've gone through some um, ethical approval process and thoughts. Then the evidence to um, do your innovation, explore your area, collect evidence so that you can look at the impact of your work. Can you also involve learners in there? There's been some really interesting teacher student uh, collaborations and projects. How can you present and report this? Then reflecting on what you've done, what you've learned and communicating to others how you will disseminate your findings. And you'll see on, on this slide, there's a little framework here, but this is um, it's a fuller one in, that you'll be able to read uh, on, on the worksheet. And as I say, it's important so that you're we're taking research informed and research led ways into developing and in investigating our practice. The reading groups can help in your initial work in thinking about what you're going to do. And you can have writing groups to to follow that as well. Um, when we've set this up, we've introduced a scholarship framework like this, but also given examples to to colleagues on one we've done earlier really like a practical example of a pro project that's been worked through and then also set up groups so that we can share works in progress as we go through our scholarship work to develop a sense of community and support people in their in their work there. As I said, the reading group can help support generally. Um, but specific might spark ideas for scholarship group. But the other, I think, important thing is also disseminating our work. Our, our knowledge is currency. We do want to share our work within our institutions and uh, much more widely. And then we're following the practices, as I say, of academics. So writing groups can be set up where you might set us a regular time, face to face or online. It is essentially book a time in a room and come together, but you can make it more or less structured. So agree on the format. It could be we're going to come together, sit in a room. When I first started this with a colleague, we used to meet five, five to seven on a Monday evening in one of the, the staff rooms. We were both working on um, research projects at the time. People used to come and interrupt us, so we started locking the door. So we said, no, no, we're writing. And we just sit and write 
for 50 minutes, stop for 10 minutes. We used to just chat and then write 50 minutes and then go home. You can put more structure in it by saying what you want to achieve at the beginning of this. I'm, I'm writing an abstract. I want to do some fast writing. Again, just sit and write and then take a break. You might use that time to pro say what you've what progress you've made or not. And then you might have a roundup at the end of what you're doing. You can develop your writing groups so they become peer review groups as well of writing that you're going to take out and, and publish. There's a lot of research on writing groups on how effective they can be. I think there's something, I don't know what it is, but there's something about coming together with people and knowing that you've got a, a shared goal of concentrating on your writing and your work at that time. There, there are different names. The first time I ever went to one, um, it was doing a fellowship draft. Someone said, oh, there's a writing boot camp. And I thought, OK, and, and, and I did work all day, but we have nicer names in our organisation for them. So we have one, we have writing time. We have one that's in the Friday morning, which is write and shine. So you put, make, you know, make it sound nice because it can be quite good to do. Another thing which, and I came across this at Bali Pim, was about the idea of having teaching and learning uh, champions. So Susie Cowley Hasseldean and Joanne Rayner in um, Warwick were talking about this. This is the idea that in your group or your network, and this can be a, you know, your own informal group or uh, groups within your organisation, is that people say, oh, I'm interested in this specific area and I'm going to do my scholarship. I'm going to do bits of reading and you'd be the person people would come to for ideas. It doesn't necessarily, well, Joanne and Susie were saying, it doesn't necessarily mean that you are the, the expert at the beginning, although you'd obviously become more expert in it because you will know about the work it, that's in that area. I think Joanne was uh, interested in systemic functional linguistics. Susie, I know, is interested in legitimate legitimation code theory and they 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 are the person the kind of go to do you know something to read about this they might be giving talks about an area so that was quite a nice pe way for people to take ownership of an area and have agency and say this, this is what I like doing this is what I'm interested in this is what I'm going to do in my scholarship again as I said on the worksheet we have some references and there's a link to the work of Joanne and Susie there I think it's you next, Lindsay. It is. Thank you, Carol. Um, so continuing looking at different approaches to how you can develop either yourself or as part of a small community. Um, one of the things that I think is quite important um, and something that I personally find very useful is to, to find your community. And just going back to what I said earlier, I think one of the reasons that I was excited about being part of this special interest group is that I didn't really feel I'd, I'd found my teacher educator community. So within my role at Edinburgh, I am responsible for CPD programmes and professional development of colleagues. Um, but I was looking for other people to talk to, which is why I always enjoy talking to Carol, um, because she does similar work. And then we that became the impetus for the, the SIG. So I think finding your community, whatever it is, whether that's a special interest group through Balip or IATEFL or any of these bigger organisations. That is one way to find like-minded people and to talk about um, the things that you enjoy talking about in your practice. So I think is a good example of finding your community, but it can also be quite individualised. And another thing that I have done more recently, a bit late to the game, you might say, but I've kind of got quite into developing my own network on Twitter. Other platforms are available, of course, but through Twitter, I've started following different people within the field of EAP. And so when I go to conferences and I hear an interesting talk, or if I'm at an online conference, I might look for that person on Twitter and begin to follow them. So that over time, I've built up a, a kind of a, a network on Twitter of people that I know contribute to the discussion and who are committed to EAP practices. And so that personally is quite a good way for me to develop. And often I'll find articles and think, oh, that's interesting. I'll see a link to something and I'll follow that. Um, so it, it's good for me personally, but also within my role as a teacher educator, a lot of ideas that I then bring into my own institution start with having read something on, on Twitter as well. There are other networks and, you know, for example, there's the Chinese Association of EAP teachers. There's things 
Um, there's Elanet, which some of you will have heard of if you're talking about EMI, so the, the network which is focused on education, languages and internationalisation, who had a recent conference at, at Edinburgh. Um, so I think finding your community is important and finding ways of connecting with those people and with social media. So you can obviously do a lot of different things um, there. Another thing that you might be able to do in if you do have a, a already a small existing community, if you're within an institution, you can also think about formalizing your CPD program of events. Um, and you might be able to negotiate with each other and develop a program for your academic year, for example. And obviously from context to context, that will vary quite a lot how you do that, how formal, how structured it is. Um, I'm in a context where that's part of my job and so ours is quite structured, but it doesn't need to be. So to organise a programme, a CPD programme, you need to have a schedule, obviously. You need to think about what it is the practitioners within that group need, what they want. And that can be as simple as asking people, small surveys. In a more for formal context, you might be looking at things which arise as part of annual review processes. Or if you have an observation programme, you might be looking at observations and thinking, oh, this is something that recurs within this group of teachers. This is something we might want to actually focus our CPD on. Um, you can negotiate what, what format this program takes. It could be talks, it could be presentations, it could be workshops, uh, reading groups, as Carol mentioned. You need to identify people who are willing to lead sessions. I think it's really important that it's not always the same person, that it's not necessarily someone who perhaps has more authority or perceived authority within the institution. The, the idea of learning champions that Carol mentioned. Um, I think it can be people who don't necessarily have a designated role for a CPD in their institution, but who have an area that they're a bit more knowledgeable, knowledgeable about and willing to share. Um, and obviously, as that goes on, you can review and evaluate that as well. So I think it can be something, a small programme of development, or it can be larger, depending on your particular context. Um, another thing that you might want to think about is an idea that we got from Leda, one of our colleagues on the, the Special Interest Group Committee, and it's about learning design workshops. And this is about coming together as a group of practitioners, identifying um, a particular focus, something that it is that you want to um, work on, whether that's working on a, a module, developing materials together. Um, so you need to find your focus and then you need to set time aside. Um, that will vary, obviously, how much time you're going to devote to it. But you need to set time aside. You need to set objectives. What is it that you want to achieve by the end of this particular session or ses series of sessions? And um, hopefully by the end of that, you have something concrete that you've achieved, that you've put together materials for a unit of work or a schedule of work, etc. So it's something specific, very focused. And the other thing, which is personal favourite of mine is observations. Um, I think all of us, whatever kind of teaching you've done, you've had the experience of being observed or perhaps being an observer as well. And I think observations are one of the ways that we can really, really get into the practical. It's important to have things like reading groups where you read about theories and you read about research that's been done, but you have to make that connection with practice. And so observations are one of the ways in which you make visible the practice and where you're able to reflect on how theory or research has informed that practice. And observations can take different forms. I think we all have experience of the scary ones where maybe it's your manager or maybe on your teacher education program, you've had someone come in and watch you with a form and write things down and then tell you tell you things that you might want to work on. Um, and these should be positive experiences. I appreciate they may be a little bit scary sometimes. But observations can also be done by peers as well. So it can be a friend from the staff room might do a little bit of spending a little bit of time in your classroom. You might spend time in their classroom and you agree together what it is you want to talk about. Maybe you're both puzzling over a particular issue and you want to you want to try and resolve that together. So you need to um, identify that with your peer and work out what that is. Um, so that would be a peer observation. It's not only the classroom that can be observed, though. I think traditionally that's what we think of. But one of the, the things that we've done recently 
at Edinburgh has looked at other aspects of teaching practice and we focused on feedback so the the kind of feedback that teachers give to students on their writing and so we've made the teacher's feedback a focus of the observation and looked at that together to see identify areas where we have um, maybe we want to say more have we developed the students feedback literacy for example are we giving students feedback which is actionable which they can transfer to to different types of learning um, so I think it's good not just to think about the observation which is more about quality assurance in an institution but which is really focused on individual practitioner development um, again as Carol has mentioned on the worksheet that we'll share the link to at the end there are some samples of observation forms that you might use to structure your observation with people as well. So I think I'm handing back to Carol now. OK, so th obviously they're, they're practical approaches that we've tried. There is literature on, on all of them, I think. But I think it is important when you um, work on any approach to also think about how you might need to adapt for your own context, the different approaches, how you might evaluate the impact of an innovation, for example, introducing a, a reading group as well. The other thing obviously is to think about the EAP teacher knowledge base, what it is that you would actually concentrate on within, for example, CPD sessions, reading groups. And I've put together some of the ideas of some aspects here that are, these are informed by uh, Schumann's work on uh, pedagogical and content knowledge, Ferguson on ESP teacher needs and um, the Bali competency framework. So we need to think about the approaches to classroom practitioner research and scholarship. How are you going to carry out your scholarship? There's been some really interesting work, particularly on identity, but on using autoethnography as an approach, action research, exploratory practice. We've had Judith Hanks talk about exploratory practice uh, in our SIG. Bond does a lot of work on that and the, and the talks are on our on our web uh, on our YouTube channel. We need to think about how do we go about re needs analysis and we need it to think about exploring the AP teacher needs but also how we can explore our students needs. What do they need to do pre their present and situ um, target situations? What are the different approaches to needs analysis from um, case studies, questionnaires, working with disciplinary content lectures and so on. A big part obviously is exploring the academic context and disciplines. What do students do? What are the practices, approaches to teaching and learning? What are the epistemologies? What are the common ways of developing and sharing knowledge within disciplines? We need to know about what, what our students are doing and that does mean in my university we talk about getting out of the house getting out of our unit and going into the wider university and engaging with people in different subject areas there within that we'll be looking at the specific genres and practices in the disciplines the le relevant linguistic lexico grammatical and rhetorical features what do our students need to process what types of texts are they engaging with what do they need to produce what do we bring as um, language specialists and applied linguists to that that we can then help our students negotiate our practice and if we're working with subject lecturers um, making explicit their knowledge of the genres and practices they'll obviously know the epistemology so that idea of working together and collaborating is really important there these are some aspects of the teacher knowledge base obviously as teachers we need to think about course and materials design the principles for these how we'd go about what's going to be effective materials, the practical pedagogical skills for planning and delivering our practice, general good teaching skills and also pedagogical content knowledge, what's involved in teaching specific aspects of academic English in in specific disciplines or in EGAP contexts, for example, genre based pod pedagogies um, huge in EAP. What does that mean? And, and what would we, how would we operationalize that and what genres would we be looking at? How do we monitor progress? How do we provide feedback and assessment of and for learning? All of these areas can form aspects of your areas to explore, maybe in reading groups, areas to explore in talks and discussions, in CPD, in your observations. 
we're obviously skimming through that one. I, I'm very aware of time, so because I think we may be finishing um, soon. There's some feedback here, but we do have a QR code there. So I'm getting quite a lot of feedback here. The, which approaches have you tried? Which would you like to a try? How would you evaluate the impact of these? And what other approaches? If you have time, you can click on that code. And also any questions that you have that you would like. I'm not sure if we've got time for people to do that, but if you can. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, if anybody's got a question, I think uh, we can. Yeah. Hi. Firstly, Hi. thanks for that excellent presentation. Oh, I, I think the entire <laughs> conference should be here. And if you don't mind, I'd like to share some of your slides. And you, if you could email the QR codes for tomorrow, because there's been a lot of talk here about the use of scholarship time, how to develop, what skills are needed, pathways yeah. into the profession. But what you've just presented is all of that. So how people can use their scholarship time, a framework for that. And I think that this is something that management need to hear as well and how they can develop their practitioners, but also workload for them as well. I just wondered if you had any guidance for the, the managers that might be at the conference as well and, and how they can incorporate this. Uh, I, I guess it'd be partly, as Lindsay was saying, of thinking about developing a CPD programme, if you're a manager, would be the most practical and then what elements that you would put into it. We've spent more and more time, obviously I'm in Glasgow, as you know, with you, but in, in our unit, uh, actually encouraging people to work through scholarship projects and, and introducing that whole cycle because we find people do a lot of innovations might be really interested in their practice but we want people to take the work out to the wider community there so it's having that and that would be what i would say in terms of the most practical thing and then there is obviously the workload we have in our university all staff are given 10 percent of time for scholarship it's never enough, but it's, it is good to have that. Our SIG in itself um, provides a forum for people to come together. So if management can actually give time, that's excellent. I've, I've always found that there are always people interested in developing teaching. So our SIG uh, there helps people that maybe don't have it institutionally. I'm not sure if that answers your question, Nicola. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's been really interesting. Okay. And um, this talk will, you know, will be recorded. Sorry, look that way. Will be recorded. It will be in the Teams channel and there will be a chance to um, for people to look at it later on as well. OK, yeah, right. the <laughs> slides, I think slides and worksheets go on the UNNC um, site, but they are also they will also be on our TED um, WordPress. Okay, all right. Just Thank to say that much. Stella's posted all of that in the chat, so people oh, have got brilliant. the links in the chat. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.